I never got to meet my grandfather, but his life story has still shaped mine deeply. When I was young, in my daydreams, I'd imagine taking walks with him around Nusco, the little hill town in Italy where he grew up. He'd tell me stories about when he was young and introduce me to long lost relatives. I've dreamed of visiting Nusco ever since. That's him at about the age I am now and uh, me daydreaming in those spiffy plaid pants. Um, <laughs> I was going to dress like that today, but my daughters convinced me 70s fashion isn't actually back in. I begin with my grandfather because my journey to this stage really began with his journey to this country. Three months after Mussolini founded the Fascist Leagues, my grandfather left Nusco and set sail for America. He was completely illiterate, signed his name with an X till the day he died. That's how Stefano Napolillo, who arrived at Ellis Island, ended up as my grandpa, Steve Neblo, who built a new life in Chicago. Having fled the alternative, he took democratic citizenship seriously. He stayed informed by talking politics with his neighbors during their bocce matches and brought my father into the voting booth to read the ballot for him. So the idea that democracy is for everyone, even a citizen completely unschooled in books and self-government, seemed completely obvious to me. I was proud of my family story and the way that it made good on the faith that democracy puts in regular people. That's a big part of why I chose political science as my calling. But when I went off to graduate school, that script got flipped. I learned that there are many political scientists who tell a much less uplifting story about people like my grandfather. Scholars called realists argued that those civics textbooks are unrealistic. Democracy is not really for everyone because most citizens can't even vote sensibly, much less guide policy. We need to set lower, more realistic expectations for them. Democracy just means every once in a while, citizens get to throw the bums out. But that's about it political professionals will handle the rest. Here's how our most influential theory of public opinion puts this point. Citizens do not think, reason, or deliberate about politics. If they're well informed, they react mechanically to partisan political ideas, and if they're poorly informed, they uncritically accept whatever ideas they encounter. When I first read this, I thought I was in the middle of a sci-fi movie discovering, discovering that my fellow citizens were really robots. And it got worse. Some realists actually compared disengaged citizens to hobbits, too simple-minded to understand the world beyond their front door. And they compare more engaged citizens to soccer hooligans, blindly supporting the home team and rabidly pushing their agenda. Better that hobbits and hooligans stayed disengaged. At the time, I didn't know where the realist argument went wrong, but I had a hunch that real democracy wasn't so inconceivable and that this might be a case of intellectuals jumping to conclusions. So I had to fight the urge to respond to the realist by saying, you keep using this word, democracy. I do not think it means what you think it means. But then I realized the realists were speaking that line to us. They think the story we tell ourselves about democracy is a myth, an immature and destructive myth. Now, hearing the realist take, you might be feeling a little insulted. I did. But you might also worry, as I also did, that there might be more to their case than we'd like to admit. After my study of democracy crashed into my lived experience, I didn't know which to believe. But the energy from the collision has driven my research ever since. I had to resolve the conflict, and I think I have. But before I tell you what we've found, I'd like to find out a little bit about what you think. I'm gonna make three statements about democracy. Please tell me which you think are true and which are false by a show of hands. Okay, statement one. Most citizens are too apathetic about politics to stay informed and engaged. Please raise your hand if you think this is basically true. 
Okay, roughly half and half, I would say, maybe a little, little more. Um, statement two. Most officials would rather please big donors than regular constituents. Raise your hand if you think this one is true. Okay, we got a lot of people not liking the politicians, no big surprise there. And finally, statement three. Most policy problems have clear solutions if everyone would just stop bickering. Raise your hand if you think this one is true. Ah, not a lot of people going for that one. Okay, thank you. At one point, I actually would have said all three statements were true, even number three, which you guys didn't like very much. Um, but after doing our research, we found that all three are largely false. They all have a grain of truth to them, which is why they're pretty widely believed. To see what I mean, let's revisit statement one. There's no doubt that many citizens are uninformed and disengaged. But it's not because they don't care. Rather, in our research, we've found that citizens are frustrated, not apathetic. They feel like nobody's paying attention to them and that politicians cater to special interests. Statement two has a similar story. Policy does tend to favor donors. But interestingly, there's very little evidence that it's because of the donations themselves. Rather, we found again, politicians are blinkered, not corrupt. By blinkered, I mean they can only see what's right in front of them. Well, disengaged citizens don't stand in front of them, but donors do, so that's who they see. There's a lot of research to show that legislators have a surprisingly poor take on where their constituents stand on most issues. But the research also shows if they get credible information, they're responsive. Statement three also seems like it's true at first. Policy research can give us clear answers to many sort of technical questions, but it can't tell us how to balance the benefits and burdens when we have to make hard cho value choices and trade-offs. Only the people who are gonna have to live with those trade-offs can do that, which is really just to say that policies need public deliberation before officials take action. Not all debate is bickering, and if we don't have public deliberation, we're only gonna know where the interest groups stand. So the public and officials need to work together to find good solutions. But we're stuck. We're stuck in a cycle of misunderstanding that prevents such cooperation. Politicians focus on the powerful people in front of them. Citizens perceive that as corruption, become frustrated, and disengage. Then the politicians perceive the disengagement as apathy and narrow their blinkers all the more. But apathy and frustration both lead to disengagement, and corruption and blinkering both lead to special interests getting their way. They look the same, so it's hard to spot the problem. The same confusion and dynamic drives the plot behind one of the most beloved stories in all of literature, Pride and Prejudice. Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth Bennet each make snap judgments about the other. That's the prejudice but they react stubbornly to being judged and in a way that makes it seem like the other's beliefs are true. That's the pride. Darcy's too proud to respond to rumors that he's mistreated his childhood friend, confirming Lizzie's prejudice. So she tries to take him down a notch, confirming his prejudice and her low social status. Only a plot twist clears up the misunderstanding and paves the way for a happy ending but we don't have to wait around for a plot twist to clear up our misunderstanding. We need to find a way to help politicians set aside their prejudice about why citizens disengage, to recognize it as frustration rather than apathy. There's no use chasing down apathetic people, but if you can reach frustrated people, you can win votes. Then politicians would have an incentive to take off their blinkers and pay attention to more than just the interest groups crowding in front of them. We call the idea that we have for accomplishing this deliberative town halls. Now, you heard the intro blurb. If you've seen town halls on YouTube, they probably look something like this. 
Now, to be clear, there's a place for protest, even angry protest in democracy. But we also need spaces for deliberation, especially now in our hyperpolarized political climate. And standard town halls are making the problem worse rather than better. They have features that really limit their value. First off, the people who show up don't look anything like the general public. Not that they're bad, they're good citizens doing their duty, but they tend to be much more partisan and affluent, which aggravates the blinkering problem. In addition, standard town halls try to cover any topic that comes up, which leads to staying at a shallow level of talking points. They also tend to proceed on the basis of very little information, sometimes mis- or disinformation. And finally, standard town halls also end up as shouting matches designed to be embarrassing to the member of Congress. In contrast, for deliberative town halls, we, rec we recruit a representative group of people, make it accessible to everyone and easy to participate. And it turns out that citizens are hungry for a better, more substantial form of politics. Our participants look more like the people who are eligible to vote than the people who actually do vote. Deliberative town halls bring disillusioned citizens back into the process. And by focusing on a single topic, we ensure going into depth. You can't maintain talking points for an hour, an hour and a half. And we provide high quality background material so everybody's on the same page and reliable knowledge guides the discussion. Finally, we use neutral moderators to make sure that the discussion stays civil and substantive and on topic and that the elected officials stay genuinely responsive. Taken together, these features completely transform citizen engagement. We know because we validated our approach using randomized controlled trials, the gold standard experiments the FDA uses to test new drugs. And we've tried them in different countries in different contexts, but all of them involving actual sitting officials talking to their real constituents about live policy questions. The forums are real politics. We've just set them up to be better politics. We started out in the United States with many, many forums, and since then have expanded Northern Ireland, Australia, the United Kingdom, and we have hopes to, to get some participation in Nigeria, Korea, Chile, Indonesia, and really anywhere people want our help trying to repair the frayed fabric of democracy. Both citizens and officials are extremely enthusiastic about the town halls. 95% say the town halls are very valuable for democracy and that they'd participate in another one. Pollsters can't get 95% of people to agree on anything. And for their part, the legislators told their colleagues about the forums and drew insights for them, from them and used them in their policy debates. And this wasn't just a matter of idle talk. Citizens changed their minds, and even more remarkably, the officials changed their minds. For example, there was a member of Congress who announced that the high quality deliberation with his constituents had persuaded him to change the version of a bill he was supporting. Our current political world almost never works like that, but it should, and it can. And these effects lasted. Four months later, the participants were more likely to vote and more likely to vote for the official who engaged with them in the way that looks more like the civics textbooks say that they should. The forums made good policy and good politics compatible again. Elected officials saw that they could do well by doing right and they jumped at it. We've designed a bunch of variations on our basic setup. My favorite involves pairing members of Congress with high school seniors, just as they've gotten the right to vote, in student-only deliberative town halls. They get an hour and a half alone with their member of Congress after having prepared uh, an issue in, in learning about democracy. We want to test and see whether this experience will inoculate them against cynicism 
as adults. I love this experiment so much because it lives out one of my favorite proverbs, which goes like this. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is now. To me, this means, yes, we should be investing in the future. But even if we haven't done that so far, that's no reason to give up. So let's set aside our pride and prejudice, break that cycle of misunderstanding, and start planting those trees. Which brings me back to my roots. Last summer, 50 years after those daydreamed conversations with my grandfather, I finally got to visit Nusco. And I actually did get to meet long-lost relatives. This is me with my cousin, who hosted us at his restaurant with a five-course feast. As I sat enjoying the delicious food, I thought about how far our family had come in the space of just two generations. And it became so clear to me for the first time that the realists don't merely get democracy wrong, they get it backwards. They say democratic politics should be left to political professionals like me, rather than people like my grandfather. But his leg of our family's journey from poverty, illiteracy, and despotism to prosperity, education, and freedom tested and prepared him for citizenship so much more than mine had for me. The realist narrative about democracy isn't realistic. It's just pessimistic. Despite all of our troubles right now, we now have proven methods that can bring out the best in people and make democracy work for everyone, for people like you and people like me and people like my grandfather. Thank you.